I want to welcome everyone this morning to the Sunday morning service that we're being held for our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to introduce myself first. I'm Pastor Dale Jensen, the pastor at Praise Tabernacle here in Rochester, Minnesota, located at 306 21st Street Southwest. And I'd also like you to join us on our web page. It's found at rochesterpraise.org. So I want to welcome everyone here today. I know there are many distractions in this world, and they try to keep us from honoring and giving glory and honor unto our Lord. So this is why I think every time we come together should be a special time to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and place him in the place that he should be. And I want to begin this morning. I want you to focus and get your mind ready to worship and give glory to the Lord. So I want to pray for all of those that are listening this morning, that the Lord may touch your heart, open up your mind, and give you a heart of worship towards your God, that you may acknowledge him in all of your ways so that he can lead and guide you. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your people. I want to thank you for all that are listening this morning. We have come to honor you and to give you glory, and I ask this message to touch the hearts of all of your children, that they may have a heart of praise and of worship towards you this morning, that they may honor you in their own homes as they praise and thank you. And as they have gathered together to hear your word, I'm asking for your spirit to minister and to touch them and to help them. And I want to thank you, Lord, for your word, and I ask for your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. So this morning, when the whole world is in confusion and chaos, the people of God should come together and come together in one mind with no other thought than to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have come this morning to brag about my Lord Jesus Christ for all the great and many works that he has done. And his glory is amongst us and his very presence and I want to turn to my first scripture this morning found in Revelations 18 and verse 1. As you read through the book of Revelation, you know this has happened after the destruction of Babylon in the book of Revelation. So I want to go there to this morning and read Revelations 18 and verse 1. It said, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And the glory is lightened. I believe this angel is none less than our Lord Jesus Christ who goes forth to battle. He is the one that the book talks about in Revelation chapter 19, coming on the white horse with a sword in his mouth, which is the word of the Lord. And he has gone forth to fight for the nations. Also in the book of Revelation chapter 6, you see the appearance of a white horse that is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ going back, going out for battle to defend his people. When you see the rider on the white horse, it is always our Lord Jesus Christ going to battle. Is he not the great warrior, the one that has always fought for his people? He is also one that leads forth in every battle that we have. So this morning I want to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ for his covenant that he has brought forth and establishment of his kingdom. As we have learned in other studies, the kingdom belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now I want to go to the book of John chapter 3, first verse 13 and 31, that we may just give the Lord all the glory and praises that is due unto him for all the mighty acts that he has done. Verse 13, I want to show you that Jesus came down from heaven, but he came down to fulfill the will of God because he was always in the mind and the very purpose of God. And he says, I have come down from heaven. It said, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that cometh down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now I want to go to verse 31. He that cometh down from above is above all. Jesus said, I have come down from heaven, so he's above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, 
and speaketh of the of the earth. He that cometh down from heaven is above all. Jesus, even at this time, is saying he's above all. No wonder why he has all power in heaven and earth, and all principalities and powers are subject to him. Now I want to go to the book of John, chapter 6, verse 38, and then verse 58. It tells us clearly that he came down from heaven in order to fulfill the will of God, the very purpose. Then the only one in heaven is God himself, who has come down in the form of man. The Bible says, Great is the mystery of godliness, but God was manifested in the flesh. He was believed down into the world, preached on to the Gentiles, and God was received up into glory. That tells us the one that came down from heaven is none other than God himself. So let's go to John 6, verse 38. He says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this truth is brought forth also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 9. Jesus came but to fulfill the will of God. Yes, he was God in human form, but nevertheless he came as a man to fulfill the will, the will and purpose of God, which God's main purpose is redemption and salvation. That's why the name of Jesus literally means Jehovah, salvation, or has become my salvation. To Hebrews 10, verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come, to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He has literally taken away the old covenant sacrifices so he could establish his own sacrifice at the cross. He has also done away with the old covenant and brought into the new. Because the Bible teaches us that the old covenant of the law came by Moses. But the second covenant, the new covenant, came by grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the covenant that we are in right now. Now I want to go to verse 58. He said, This is the bread that cometh down from heaven, speaking of himself. Not as your fathers eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So the Lord had great power, and in his words, the authority that he spoke with, many question him. But every word that he has ever said is true. Yes, we just need to know and understand why he is speaking in the manner and the things that he does say. He said he shall live forever that eateth of the bread. He's talking about having communion with Christ. Now I want to show to you that Jesus had great authority. And I want to worship him for his authority and his power because he still has all power in heaven and earth. He has all authority. Who do you think should direct our lives but the Lord Jesus Christ? And we as his people should be ready to give him all glory and honor and praises and worship that belongs only to him. So now I want to go to cha chapter 5 of John, beginning with verse 26 through 29. Here Jesus begins to show you the power and the authority that he had. Remember when he forgave the sins of that one man? They all began to question him for what he was showing to them, that he has the power and the authority to forgive sins. They said only God has the power and the authority. What Jesus is saying, I have authority and it's been given to me to forgive sins upon this earth that you may know that I have power and authority. Verse 26, for says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son, or to Jesus, to have life in himself. Now I want to go to verse 27. And hath given him, the Son, authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. God gave him this authority as a man. Verse 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in the which that all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. At that day, the last day, every man will hear his voice and come before the judgment seat of God. 
That's how powerful the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ is. He's talking about his voice that they shall hear. Now let's go to verse 29. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You mean the Lord Jesus Christ has that authority? He talked about the power of his word. He talks about his word dwelling in us. He talks about us being begotten of the word. So all these things I want to give him glory and honor because he is the true judge. Who is going to judge on that last day? It's none other than him that has all authority. Our Lord Jesus Christ will sit on the throne and he will judge all humanity. Now I want to go to the book of John chapter 10 and verse 18. We're still doing, dealing with the authority that he has. And I want to read this statement to you. He says, no man take it from me or the power and authority that he has. But I lay it down. He's talking about his own life. He said, I will lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. No man could have forced him to do it, but he has the power to lay it down. And I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. He's been given authority and power. And he has showed it in the earth when he simply spoke to those that were sick. He just said, be thy healed. See the power and the authority that has come forth from our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we are to worship him and praise him. Because all authority that we have, as anyone may have, it all comes directly from the authority that is given unto us. The only authority we have is what Christ gives us. And he gives us authority to go and preach his gospel. And he has given us authority to pray for the sick. Now I want to go to John chapter 17, verse 1 through 5. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes towards heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Jesus said, I have already glorified the Lord God. And let's continue on. As thou hast given him power, the Son, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. You mean Jesus has the power to give eternal life? Yes, he does. So you must understand his divine purpose and the power that was in him. He could have called down legions of angels to defend him at the cross. And he had the power to do it, but he chose not. He preferred the suffering over the glory at that moment. Because later on, he would receive the glory. And all the glory and all the world will ultimately worship him for what he has done. Verse 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, even Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So they must come to know Jesus. Verse 4 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. Jesus did that in his earthly ministry. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. God gives us a work to do too, and we must finish it. Now in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me, with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus was glorified. He glorified God when he was here in the flesh, but he rose again and he was glorified. Hallelujah. And he also has become the glory or the one that is to illuminate the world. Now I want to go to the book of John chapter 1 verse 4 and 5, then verse 9 and 14. Yes, he has all power, and he is the one that illuminates everyone. The Bible says in him, or in the word, or in Christ, was life, and the life was the light of man. Verse 5 says, And the light shineth into dar in darkness, 
and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light of the world. Let's go to verse 9. Verse nine. He said, That was the true light, or Christ, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus is the glory of God. Let's go to John verse, chapter 1 and verse 14. Why? Because he was in the Word. He was the Word from the beginning. He was in the very plan and the purpose of God. That's why at a certain time in history, he came forth as the Son of God to fulfill the will of God and the Son of Man in order to do what he needed to do as a prophet that came forth to fulfill the very word of God. Verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the, his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We noticed we saw the glory. Now I want to go to John chapter 8 and verse 12 to show you that Jesus, yes, is the light. He's the very essence and the glory. Let's go to John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus, because of the power and authority he had, he gave eternal life to those that believe on him. Now let's go to John chapter 9, verse 5. He says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus came to illuminate and become the light of the world. Now I want to go to chapter 12 of John, beginning with verse 46 through 48. He says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Verse 46. Now I want to go to verse 47. If any man hears my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He tells us his, his, his divine purpose was to save the world. But nevertheless, he says, you must receive my words. You cannot reject the words of the Lord Jesus Christ or change them in any manner or form. He said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, you see the power of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, as one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day or in the last day judgment. The words that Jesus spoke would become their judge. And he will also become the judge to everyone in that last day. The very words, you can either receive them or reject them. Now I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. That thou keepest this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show, show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I believe he has already revealed who is the only potentate and the true God, as we know Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he will reveal this to all mankind. And at that time, they every knee will bow to him and confess that he is the Lord. Remember the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. That Lord is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why this morning I want to give all glory and praises and lift him up. He is the ruler of all things. As I've taught you before with these studies, you and I must come under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning. So I want to continue on with this study. Verse 16, who only 
The King of kings and the Lord of the Lord hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. When no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power and everlast, a power everlasting. Amen. So we begin to realize that the Bible only speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ and his power and his authority. Yes, he has power and authority, but he has done the greatest work that anyone could ever do, and that's why I want to honor him today. He brought salvation to the whole world, which no other man could do. You look in the book of Revelation, it talks about the book that was open, which is the new covenant. He was the only one that was worthy to even look into and to open up the seals of the, of the book of life was the Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation is talking about the new covenant which was established by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to continue to give him glory. I want to go to the book of Ezekiel 43, verse 1 through 7. And let's begin with the very first verse. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even to the great the gate that looketh towards the east. The east in the Bible is always a place of entrance. In the Garden of Eden you came in through the east gate. Into the temple you came in on the east side. So the east talks about the entrance into the kingdom of God, yes, into everything that the Lord has. It says verse 2, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, or God's entrance and glory always enters in through the east. And the voice was like a voice, like a noise of many waters. That's the voice of God. And the earth shine with his glory. You'll find this also referring to our Lord Jesus Christ in Revelations chapter 1, verse 15. When the Lord enters into some place, he enters in and his glory is there. Now I want to go to verse 3 of Ezekiel 43. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw. Even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. It's talking about the book of Ezekiel. is talking about the destruction of that city. And that's the city that the book of Revelation is speaking of. Because Ezekiel was talking about the destruction of that city, that great city that was destroyed, which we know as Babylon. Also, to those that are interested, it also was the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 66 to 70 A.D. So let's continue on in order to establish the new covenant and the kingdom. It said, And the visions were like the visions that I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell upon my face. Now I want to go to Ezekiel 1 and verse 28. It said, And as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of the Lord, so was the appearance, or the, the day of rain, excuse me. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Verse 4 says, And the glory of the Lord came into that house, it does today too, because the house is talking about the house of God or in the church, by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east, east is the entrance into. Now I want to go to verse 5. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Remember I told you, in the book of Ezekiel from 37 to the very end, it is now talking about the fulfillment of the church where God's presence and power would be there. The book of Revelation also shows this to you in chapters 19 through 22 where the presence of the Almighty dwells there and it is in the church of the living God. This is why this minister proclaims the church 
and in the Lord Jesus Christ as what God has proposed in his heart to bring forth under the new covenant. Verse 6 says, And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. So we're always to give the Lord praise and glory and honor. And I want to go to a few more verses this morning. I want to go now to the book of Psalms 24, verse 7 and 8. A lot of times we read this verse about the triumphal entrance of the Lord, but we don't realize that he is the king that has come to enter in. And the Bible teaches that there is but one king, and that is the Lord God himself. That's why the nation of Israel, when they desired another king, they were simply telling God, you're not going to rule over us. You're not our king. We want to be like all the other nations. But they were called to be separate, completely distinct from the other nations, that they may bless the world in which they were disobedient to the covenant that was given to them. So now I want to go to the book of Psalms 24, verse 7 and 8. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And that prophecy was of the Lord Jesus Christ when he entered into Jerusalem. He is the King of glory. That's why all glory and honor is due unto him. The Old Testament said, the Lord says, I will share my glory or my honor with no one. This was what it tells you when Jesus received the glory and the honor. He was the one of the Old Testament, the one true God that came in human form in order to pay the price. It says, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. This is why you always see the Lord riding upon a white horse. Yes, with the sword in his hand, but he is the one that goes forth and leads into battle. And this is what Revelation teaches you. Jesus is the mighty warrior, always going into battle to fight. Our God is a fighter. He's a warrior, and he will perform his will. So now I want to go to the book of Psalms 29 and verse 3. It says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The, glory, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. You notice throughout the Bible it speaks about the voice that comes over many waters. That's the voice of the Lord God himself. Now I want to go to Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 4. And he said, And his brightness was as the light. He had horns or coming out of his hand, means power, and there was the hiding of his power. Talking about our Lord who has all the power. Now I want to go to Revelations 21, verse 10 and 11. Here again, John, just like Ezekiel, is being carried away. He said, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. That great mountain is where God dwells. It's known as Mount Zion. But now when you look into the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24, it tells you who Zion now is. It's none other than the church of the living God. So when he takes him to this high mountain, he's revealing to him the church. That's why the church is the utmost important to the Lord God and his plans. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Once again, he's talking about the church. When it says it's come down, it descends from heaven. That means it has its origin, its origin, origin in heaven itself by God himself who has created the church. And within the church, or the new Jerusalem, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. You'll notice the Lord always used precious stones when he is describing what is precious to him. 
Does not the Bible tell us we are lively, we are precious stones unto the Lord? Here in Revelation, he's talking about the church, the church of the living God, and how his glory is in its midst. And he becomes the very light of the church. I want to go now in closing to Revelations chapter 21, verse 22 through 27. It says, And I saw, it's talking about the new Jerusalem, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Jesus Christ became the temple of God, and all it means is where God's Spirit dwells. So you want to know in the new covenant where God dwells? He dwells in the temple. He was in Christ. The Bible said God was in Christ reconcile the world unto himself. So it's talking about the very presence of God was in the life of the man Christ Jesus. So we want to continue on. Now the temple of God is who? It is us, his people. He says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of God, which you have received? He talks about sanctifying the temple. The temple should always be sanctified. Our lives should always be sanctified. And that's why we go to the Lord to sanctify us. Verse 22 or 23 now. It says, And the city had no need of sun. The church has no need of natural light. Neither of the moon. They are just there to bring forth light into this world, but not into the kingdom of heaven or into the church to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. See what precious he is, things he has done for his church? Christ literally dwells in the midst of his people. His very presence, he is glory is there. He has become the light of his church and of his people. He tells us also to become the light of the world. So let's continue on. I want to show you that the salvation is for all nations. All nations will be in this city, the New Jerusalem, or the church. And the nations of them which are saved. You see, God's purpose is to save all the nations. It says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to do bring their glory and honor into it. It tells me that all the nations will be in the church, the new Jerusalem. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. God's word of salvation is always present. He does not close the gates of the church or the entrance into his body. It said, And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no more light, no more night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, for all the Gentile nations. That's why you and I are part of the new Jerusalem, the church of the living God. And it says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. You cannot defile. Anything that defileth will not enter into the church or the new Jerusalem. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And this is why I want to thank the Lord and honor him today for everything that he has done. He's always been in the plan and the purpose of God where he would come to bring redemption. And this is why I want to give him glory. I'm redeemed because of his cross, because of his blood that was shed. So today I want to honor him for his great and mighty works. And the greatest work the Lord has ever done was to give his life at Calvary, which is a conforming to the will and the purpose of God that he may come and die and give his life for you and I to bring forth salvation. So this one great act is enough to worship him forever and ever. You notice in Revelation, they're all gathered around the throne of God. 
and they're worshiping and singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. And you see that the crowns that they wear, these are victory crowns. These are the victories that they have overcome in their lives. God has given them a crown. But you notice because how worthy the Lord is when he reveals all these things to you, they will take their crowns and cast them at his feet. And this is why I want to honor him today. And I want to close in prayer. And I'm asking you to join me to give glory and honor and praises to your Lord and Savior. This morning I decided to glorify my Lord Jesus Christ because there is no other. There was no God formed before him and neither will there be after. He said, I alone am God. And our God came to save us. He came manifested in the flesh, went to the cross because he loved us and he ordained our salvation. So in closing today, Lord, I want to thank you. And I'm asking for the whole congregation to begin to worship you and give you glory and honor and praises and power. Today I have come to glorify you and speak of your mighty acts and the power that has come into the world. There has come no greater power into this world but the spirit of the resurrected Christ. And that's why your kingdom is here. We've already been translated into your kingdom. We have become the sons and daughters of God. We have entered into the kingdom as you have told us through the water and of the spirit. So I want to glorify you for all your words that you have ever spoken. You're bringing forth the greatest work was my salvation and the salvation of your people. For this, Lord, I want to honor you for as long as I live because I realize that I have entered in to a covenant with my Lord and Savior and it's a covenant like marriage. So I want to keep my vows before you, Lord. I want to honor you in all ways and I ask your people to honor you too and make that decision to honor you from now and forever because we are your bride. The church now has become the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true bride. And I want to thank you for what you have done for us and your people. And we desire to continue to do your will. And we ask for your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. So I want to thank everyone that is listening this morning. May the Lord bless you, shine his countenance upon you. Always honor the Lord God. Speak great things of what the Lord has done in your life. The Bible talks about having a testimony. Give your testimony to all men and glorify the Lord in everything that you say. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen.